Before we dive into today's conversation with Neil Satin, we want to remind the therapists in our listening audience to stay tuned to the end of today's episode. We're going to talk a little bit more about Revision, the upcoming retreat we have that's going to be happening this August. The practice of being seen is about understanding who you really are and daring to share your truth with the world. This is a conversation with and for seekers, creators, and holders of transformation. We believe that stories shape relationships, and relationships shape stories. This is Rebecca Wong, relationship therapist and founder of Connectfulness. And this is Marisa Gowdy, writer and storytelling coach for healers. And this is The Practice of Being Seen. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Today, we're excited to welcome Neil Satin onto the podcast. Neil is a healer, writer, and relationship coach, and is also the host of the popular podcast, Relationship Alive, where he talks to the world's experts on the topics of how to do love right. He and his partner, Chloe, also created the New Love Paradigm, where they have created Thriving Intimacy, a seven-week course that synthesizes the best current wisdom on deepening intimacy in relationship. They also produced a course called 21 Days to Deeper Intimacy for the popular website dailyohm.com. Neil also writes and plays music, trains dogs, and is a father to two lovely young children. Welcome, Neil. Hi, it's great to be here. We're really happy to have you here. And I love that in your introduction, you talk about not just being in relationship, but playing music, training dogs, and being a dad. Yeah, I mean, so much of that feeds into how I show up in relationships. So it's really important as far as I can tell. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm especially taken by the training dogs part because I have found um, in my own journey along being a relationship therapist that I have recently gotten a dog a few years ago and training her has really changed some of how I practice. That makes total sense to me. In fact, I've talked about this on my show that uh, my dog training life is what led me into doing couples work. So it's oh, part, go par, there. part of the Tell journey. Tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, the the shorter version of this story is that I had a dog, uh, you know, that I got right out of college, um, adopted this dog, and you know, somehow a prior owner had managed to turn her from a sweet little puppy dog into a dog that was really fierce around other dogs, really aggressive. And I tried desperately to figure out how to solve that problem. And conventional dog training methods just didn't work with her, whether I was trying to, you know, Caesar Milan the dog and, you know, be the alpha or, you know, treat everything that was that was going right and discourage things that were going wrong. So behaviorism, like both of those things just were not working for me. And I found this guy in um, Vermont who had this totally different way of looking at dog behavior that was all filtered through the lens of their emotional interactions with the world. And in particular for a dog, how that translates into their prey drive and prey prey energy and predator energy. And, you know, I can tell you in a minute how this directly translates into relationship work. But as far as um, dogs go, what I learned quickly Um, through doing this kind of training and I apprenticed with him and then went on to like produce a DVD set and this was sort of my life prior to really being focused on relationship work and my dog went from being you know 90% aggressive to being 90% really friendly and trustworthy with other dogs there's always that 10% you know with a problem dog where you know you you Mm -hmm. gotta you gotta pay attention Um, just like how you can be in a really troubled situation and um, even the best situations require maintenance. So if you're if you pretend you're just going to coast through now, everything's fixed and we're all better, then you're going to find yourself probably right back where you started at some point. So um, so anyway, one really important aspect of the dog training work was how the emotional state of the owner was impacting what the dog was doing. And we had this mantra, which is the dog is always right. Um, so what, whatever the dog is doing is actually totally understandable if you look at the entire environment. It's kind of like a systems way of yeah. looking at like family therapy, that sort of it's thing. It's so relationship focused. Exactly. So, um, and as you might expect, one of the biggest things that has an impact on a, a dog owner's emotional life is what's happening with them 
in their relationship with a significant other, or sometimes their stress around loneliness or, you know, all of that. So um, I ended up doing a lot of, at the time, it was informal coaching. I had studied some psychology as an undergrad and had led encounter groups and that sort of thing. Um, and that was translating into my trying to do almost like gestalt work with dog owners as, as a way of helping them be really grounded and present with their dog so they could see how it, what was going on within them was having an impact on their dogs. Um, and in the process found that I had a real love for working with people around their relationships, around those things that were causing them a ton of stress and hopefully a ton of joy as well when they had breakthrough moments especially. Um, and so while my dog practice continued, and, and it continues to this day, I still work with clients via Skype every so often, though most of that is just, you know, I have an online dog course and DVDs that I, that I sell and a, and a website that people read. So I veered into doing more direct coaching work around people with relationships, and I, I trained with um, the Robbins Madonnas Institute, which is a collaboration between uh, Tony Robbins and Chloe Madonnas. Uh, Chloe Madonis, who was one of the founders of Strategic Family Therapy, and I mean, everyone kind of knows who Tony Robbins is and has an opinion about him one way or another. What was interesting was to find, um, like, I had this picture of him and his work as really being kind of sensationalized and, and almost like, you know, he, than life. exactly, <laughs> like he was just about making money online and or mm. making money through infomercials. And like, I had this caricature picture mm. of him. And, um, you know, it's very close to how we tend to think of other people. We develop our stories about them, and then they live right into our stories. And um, so I had this story about Tony Robbins, but when I started watching his interventions with, um, with people and the work that he was doing when he's working with someone focused for an hour, two hours, days sometimes, and then hearing Chloe Madonis, who... You know, you kind of can't argue with her credentials as far as, um, you know, having studied with Milton Erickson and, and creating this whole branch of therapy with Jay Haley. Um, I started to get a, a totally different appreciation of the work that he was doing and, and how it was part of that same lineage of um, how we show up in the moment to alter the system that someone is in or alter their story, either about other people or about themselves, and how they can come to understand their own, their own behavior, what motivates them. Um, so I trained with them, and that really led me down the relationship path. And, and that's how those two things fit together. You know, one thing I want to just kind of loop back to, as you said, you know, we develop our stories for other people. And then I think you might have said, and they tend to live into them. But it seems like your observation of Tony Robbins' work was an opportunity for you to recognize like, oh, he actually didn't necessarily fully fit my stereotype. And he lived into it from another angle and taught me how to look at the way we step into a situation with stories and have permission to reframe them and rewrite them in the moment as we're given more information. Absolutely. Yeah. And for me, that really translates into waking up and and refining what curiosity means and and how we can always be in the question, um, even when we think we have certainty about things to uh, to to live into a question, not a question that destabilizes a situation, you know, because if you're in like, let's say you're in a really happy relationship, you don't want to always be questioning like, am I really safe? Because, you know, that's going to destabilize the system. So there are, there are times when you can maybe put some questions to bed. Um, <laughs> but it's more like, how do you learn the art of generative questioning so that the questions that you're asking are keeping you open and helping you I almost get out of the story, and maybe this is, I'll be curious to hear your take on this because I know you're a lot about stories. So it's like, how do you just like get out of the story and step outside so that it can start to rewrite itself? You know, and I think that you just kind of hit on something there. One of the, the things I had just jotted down for myself while you were, while, while we were talking was um, you were talking about how do we show up to alter the story, mm -hmm. right? And it's that that piece about waking up, that piece about kind of like breaking through and seeing what's the illusion here? Like, what is the story that I'm telling 
myself about me or about the situation that isn't totally accurate? And how do I live into it? How do I let go of the story so that it doesn't shape me, that I have a role in this? Mm, yeah, exactly. I think that's per perhaps where that curiosity is leaning into also, that sometimes the curiosity is about breaking out of that illusion, um, breaking out of the, those stories that hold us stuck. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and there, there's no place where people hold stories more than either in their relationships, so their story about their partner or about themselves and how mm -hmm. they, who they are in life and in love. And then maybe third, and I'm just making this up, so I haven't actually studied this, would be, <laughs> would be their dogs, like their story about <laughs> why their dog does what, whatever their dog does. All kinds of great stories there yeah. that, that may or may not actually be helpful. And then their kids. The right. dogs might even come before the kids. <laughs> I think they do, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think so much of us being all about story is that it's it gets to be such a nuanced question because, you know, we can meet with, yeah, we really appreciate that leaning into stories and understanding why they're there and how they shape our relationships. And then we also talk about the constant reshaping of stories and understanding that they're not static things. I mean, we look back from the myths that have defined what it means to be human. In many, many cases, there are countless different versions that reflect where we are at any given period in history. And so that's how it works on the grander scale. And I think it works on the human scale and the human lifetime, how mm. we get to keep revisiting, reshaping those stories so that they change our relationships to ourselves and to others. And I, I know that in my work as a relationship therapist, and I'm sure that this will resonate with you too, Neil, when, when my couples come in to see me, there are at least three stories in the room. There's not one story, you know? And so, so much of the work is about kind of hearing and seeing things from multiple perspectives and letting that all seep in and become, like all of it become information that informs the story. Mm, yeah, yeah. And being able to show each uh, half of a couple if you're working with a, you know, with a dyad and not like a yeah. polyamorous situation, um, getting them to really fully understand not only each other's story, but also how that leads to that perspective of, um, you know, where you understand that your partner is quote unquote, right. The same way I was saying earlier that the dog is always right. It's like what your partner is doing always makes sense to them, just like what you're doing makes sense to you. Um, so it, I think it helps you really get that higher level view of where it all makes sense, which makes it a lot easier to be proactive in a situation, especially a, a troubled situation. So what's really important here is that when you're working with a couple, typically, even though, like, let's say a couple comes in with a problem and one of them is convinced that the other person is um, being a jerk. And, like, that's really rare, right? That they would think that. And... Um, <laughs> And But of course, they are totally like, I'm above reproach in this situation. My partner is a jerk. I, I'm, everything I do is totally reasonable and understandable. And so the more that you can understand your partner's perspective so that what they're doing makes total sense to you. So it's like, you know, we have this common phrase that like, oh, yeah, if I were in your shoes, this is what I would do. And typically when you have that conversation, when someone's like, well, what would you do if you were in my shoes? You say, well, if I were in your, sh your shoes, I would do exactly what I would do because I'm me, right? So you say something like, I would do this thing that I do because it's who I am. But what is so different is if someone asked you that question, what would you do if you were in my shoes? And you said, well, if I were in your shoes what I would do is exactly what you're doing because by being in your shoes, I can see the world the way you see the world. I can see how what, how what I'm doing is affecting you like through your, through your heart. I can experience how that's really affecting you. So actually what I would do is exactly what you're doing. It's that level of understanding that I'm talking about. And that's such a deeper level because that, that really t like, one of the things that a lot of my mentors sometimes talk about 
are how in every complaint that either partner issues, there's always a prescription for something like of repair. There's always um, your partner's complaining about something, but really what they're doing is they're telling you exactly what they need. And this level of understanding takes you there too. Yes, exactly. Yeah, one another way that I've heard that phrased is that within every complaint is a request. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this is getting at that, and at the same time, it gives you um, a level of compassion for what is going on with your partner. Um, and also, I, I think there's that often what comes up because the core issues. This is probably what you see a lot, Rebecca. Is the core relation relationship issues start around safety and one or the other are both people not feeling safe. Mm -hmm. And and within that, there's often this belief that my partner's actually out to get me and 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 I really am not safe. So anything that you can do to see like, oh, what my partner is doing is not actually about them being out to get me. It's not about like my them trying to make my life more difficult. It's actually about them trying to fill their own needs. And if you can appreciate what they're doing from that perspective, now you can change the conversation where you're like, oh, okay, you have these needs and, um, and this is how you're trying to fill those needs. And it's actually really uh, shitty for me. It's like really, you know, that's really hurting me. So like maybe we can find a way, you know, this is where you get to the win-win stuff. Um, but you don't get there, I think, unless you can really appreciate where your partner's coming from and see like, oh, yeah, this is actually isn't about me. It really feels like it's about me. Um, and, you know, it can be challenging sometimes as the coach or the, the helper, the healer to um, to help each person see that it's actually not about them in those situations. But that, that's where you start really showing up with them to help alter that story. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I like that. You know, and I, I couldn't help as you were, as you were sharing that, that part about the core issues being about safety, my mind flipped right back to dog training and I thought, oh, gee, it's like the exact same thing there too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know? Because as soon yeah. as a dog is in fight or flight, then, you know, you can have, you can be as alpha or you can have the tastiest treat in front of them and they're not, you know, nothing's going to happen. They're not going to respond. And that's just like when you're talking with your significant other or even as a therapist, when your client triggers you and <laughs> suddenly you're, go you're offline and you're, you know, there, if you don't take that step of bringing yourself back into regulation, um, then you you're not really showing up present for the person that's there with you. So that brings us into this, this other piece. I know one of the things that you try to help people with both on your podcast and your courses and through coaching is to help teach people how to escape those automatic patterns. So that talks a little bit about this regulation. Can we dive into that a little bit and talk about how you learned about this, what, what it means to you and, and what you really teach? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. This is, this is one of those things where it's not only about the work that I do with people, but it's about my own personal work in my life and, you know, what I've, what I've seen unfold in my relationship. And, um, it, there's a lot of talk, let's say, in, in, um, how to show up in life that's based around how you be, how you're present. And how can you be more present? How can you be in the moment? How can you respond so you're not like a victim of your past, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and what I was realizing for myself is that as present focused as I could be, when my partner, Chloe, would look at me a certain way or make a comment that sounded a certain way, whatever it was, suddenly I was, it, I was no longer present or I could be present, but what I was present to was like how my heart was racing or how angry I got all of a sudden. And if you were stuck in like the paradigm of like, okay, well, how do I, how can I be present? You might say something to your partner about like how your partner just totally pissed you off. Cause like, oh my God, now I'm so angry because of this. And so like being present is actually like potentially a treadmill where you're just like on this ride and and it it's not necessarily taking you anywhere productive. I mean, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So, um 
So, Marisa's face just lit up when you talked about being present, being a treadmill. I just I, had to pause. And yeah, you out. know, I'm just kind of just excited that someone's brave enough to kind of take this one on because there's certain <laughs> moments like I think this may have come up on a, another episode, and like, I remember like I was trying to be present as my children were screaming, and I was just like, you know, I need to tune out here in order to keep everyone alive because yeah. I'm driving the car, and like <laughs> I'm gonna just go to the coast of Ireland where there's no one near me except a couple of seabirds. And that's what's going to happen. So everybody gets out of the car alive. Safe. Yeah, safe. Yeah. And, I, you know, and um, so I'm, I'm totally hearing you. And I just, I love that there's this, um, a rebelliousness in that. And I appreciate it very much. So please go on. I'm grinning over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, thank you. And for so for me, what's so important is in those moments of being conscious of the choices that you're making around how you keep everyone safe and and how you bring yourself back to presence. It's recognizing that as soon as you are angry or as soon as you are checking out, then you're no longer in, you're no longer present actually in that moment. So even if you're present to that, you're not present in the way that I'm talking about because present in the way that I'm talking about is almost like um, it's like what Steve Porges talks about in terms of um, polyvagal regulation. You're social, you're, um, you're breathing normally, you have prosody in your voice, you're creative, you're, um, you know, Dick Schwartz talks about this in terms of the energy of self versus the energy of your parts. And um, so for me, what I see is like, oh, if I want to come from this place where I'm actually able to solve the problem or um, or let something kind of roll off my back, then I can't do that from a place of being checked out or feeling defensive, which is, you know, flight or fight. So um, presence yeah. becomes a way of kind of monitoring that and saying like, I'm feeling highly triggered right now. I need to do something to self-soothe and I'm consciously choosing to do that. And then I will come back. Exactly. So it's that step beyond my taking a vacation in my brain. <laughs> well, it, right. it, it, it's, it's consciously saying like, I need to take a step away. I need to take that vacation in my brain and I know when to come back. Right. 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 And, and what's right. so challenging and what Marisa and what you were saying is, you know, Whatever you think about mirror neurons or aside, mm -hmm. um, when you're in a situation like that, everyone is dysregulated. Like it's not just right. you. So sometimes you do have to just be like, I'm focusing on the road and like, <laughs> whatever, you know, whatever's going on with you, like you're just going to have to deal with it. And I hear you saying you hate me and that I don't love you and like whatever it is or like, honey, I should have, you know, checked Google Maps or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and but that's also like because you're going there with the mirror neurons. That's also a way to to bring everybody else back online by bringing yourself back. Exactly, exactly. And it's it's probably one of the most challenging things in relationship. Mm. But until it is happening, it's really way more challenging to do the other work of relating, which is kind of getting past all of that stuff. Yeah. Mm. Um. Because that is definitely possible. Um, but where most people find themselves is just um, managing and coping around like how they trigger each other and, and doing that dance. You know, and I'm, I'm hearing a parallel here. We, we recently had Terry Reel on and he talked a lot about the importance of timeouts. And I'm thinking as you're talking about this, um, this regulation, it's so much the same conversation. It's so much about knowing how to, how to kind of take that time out from the relationship to regulate yourself so that you can come back into relationship. Yeah, exactly. And I love Terry's work. Um, he's been on my show a couple times. I think really the important thing, and he probably even mentioned this, is to always bear in mind the safety. So you're taking a time out and you're at least communicating. And this is one of those places where it's helpful yeah. to have a protocol. Um, so because when you are, when you're triggered, um, it's really hard to do anything. So sometimes it can be all, it can take all of your strength to just be like, I'm leaving the room, you know, and I'm, I'm taking myself out of this. Um, but if you have a protocol with your partner of, 
I'm leaving the room and I will be back in 10 minutes. Or, um, you know, for a partner who doesn't need a timeout, who's more of a, you know, needs that connection to be like, I just need to, I just need to hear these words from you. Or I'm really freaking out right now and I just need to you to know that you are actually safe and I'm still safe. Um, even though we're we're in this tumultuous situation. And the I think there's that- a lot of different ways to say that in different relationships. Sometimes the word safe might feel a little off for some couples, mm. but maybe what they really need to hear is I might seem like I'm, you know, going somewhere else in my head right now, but I'm really in this with you. Like I'm I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving our relationship. I'm not leaving us. Yes. Yeah, I just perfect. feel like behind this whole conversation for the last several minutes, I'm seeing just the word trust, just kind of just uh, circle around all of this. That well, we're that's saying. what relationships are, isn't it? Right. I mean, they're they're a dance of trust and safety. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, what I aspire to help people do is to get to a place in their relationship where the trust really is rock solid Mm -hmm. not from a place of like you're like a place of boredom like i know everything about this person so i trust or or they're so goddamn loyal that i trust like not that kind of trust the kind of trust that comes from real real um resiliency in relationships Mm -hmm. so you you know like okay when we fight we repair When something tough comes up, we always have each other's back. When I see how my partner exits the relationship, I'm able to bring that up in a way that helps close that exit. Or I see that in myself, or I invite my partner to see that. It's almost as if you're saying, I believe in us. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And once you get to that point, um, then you can start doing other stuff. Um, So you're not necessarily in... And it's not to say that that your trust may not be um, triggered at some point, that you may find like another safety thing come up down the road where you realize like, oh, like, okay, I guess that wasn't handled. Or, oh, here's something new that I hadn't even thought about. Um, but ideally for a couple, they get past that stage where it's just like, can I trust you? Can I not trust you? Like they get to a place where they're fully trusting and then they're able to think about, okay, how do we grow? Like, what are, what's, our, what's our mission as a couple in the world? And how do we do something bigger? That whole, you know, some bigger than the sum of our parts kind of work that couples can do. Yeah, and I, I'm also kind of leading into that with you and thinking all of those unknowns, all that questioning, all that curiosity that can open itself up and be the stuff that you don't know about. The trust also is that we can we can do this. We can have these difficult conversations. We can we can go to these places where we don't know the answers, um, and that just the not knowing isn't the thing that triggers us anymore. That we we know we can do that together. Mm, yeah, I love that. That's so true because the as much as we do need uncertainty in our lives to um, keep things from feeling stagnant. Um, that is a, a clear trigger for a lot of people. And, and so, yeah, how do you do that dance? How do you support each other through the unknown? Right. Um, yeah, that's, without that's victimizing huge. each other, without shaming each other, without going into that blame game and all of those triggery points that relationships can just naturally have. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so that goes back to the curiosity that we were talking mm-hmm. about and how you become an invitation to those things. Um, So many people, um, and I have been like this in the past, um, part of the dance of relationship is like, you you have those initial moments of like uncertainty and does this person want me and do they love me the way I love them and like all of that stuff and that, that, that creates like that potent cocktail that happens when two people meet and then... Often what happens after that is kind of like buttoning everything up. So it's like all those mysteries, like, okay, mystery solved, mystery solved. And so people end up living, That's and that's where you get to the story that we were talking about. They live into their story of who this person is and what they mean to me and what they're capable of and all of those conclusions that they've had. And then, you know, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, 
sometimes even, you know, further down the road, they're looking and they're like, well, where does, where can this go? Like this relationship is concluded because I have all these conclusions about this person. So, um, so I love uh, helping um, shift people into opening like, okay, now that this is settled, where's, where's the new opening? How do we explore together? And bringing it beyond the courtship phase, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll reveal this, that in my own marriage, there was a lot of really exciting things that happened during, as my husband says occasionally, oh, honey, that was courtship. And it was some of that was just those, <laughs> the, the, the stores he would go to with me, the retreat he would try with me, all that stuff. He's like, and I'm like, I know, honey courtship. <laughs> and, you know, and it, l- luckily we can make a joke about it. And I'm able to kind of say like, okay, I need, I need some courtship right now. And we know that this is like, let's go back 13 years and say, I have this idea and we're going to try it today. And it's outside the comfort zone. Let's give it a shot. Courtship. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I could see, you know, like that being part of the strategy of keeping, of nurturing the courtship, nurturing the romance as you go. Which I think is another interesting piece of this conversation, because I believe that that's something that, you know, even an 80-year-old relationship needs to nurture. There's there's that spark, that that curiosity, that that growth, that stuff doesn't just it doesn't just happen. It's not just, it's always something that's outside of the comfort zone. And it just comes so, as such a, and it has such a nice connection to Neil's idea of if you've had all these conclusions and the yeah. relationship is going to conclude. So we'll introduce a third C let's try courtship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like it. I like yeah. it. Uh, and I'm also just thinking too about how, even that can sometimes become something where people feel like they're in lack, like, okay, there's not enough courtship happening. And, you know, Mm -hmm. does, does my partner even love me anymore? Um, So what I love about what you were saying, Rebecca, was the, um, like bringing courtship in, in a way that's funny and playful and, you know, not, it's reminding you that like, this is part of the game that we're playing. The, this is, it's also where that like prey predator dynamic comes in that I was talking about way in dog, the dog training part of our conversation where it's like, how do you, how do you seduce your partner or how do you, how do you chase them? But how do you do it in a way that's actually you guys having fun, not where you're trying to like prove something to each other. And, and I think that's what Marisa really illustrated in her story is that she and her partner have this, they've like shorthanded that what this um, what this pattern is that they have discovered within their relationship, mm. and through their shorthand, they're able to kind of have this more jovial, lighthearted conversation. That kind of, I know it, you call it kind of poking the bear, but it, it's kind of um, this this way of just going direct to it and say, like, okay, so we need more of this in our life right now because we have the shorthand. We need more courtship. For, you know, that's a way of saying I need more play or I need more curiosity or I need something more spontaneous. And it took a lot of long conversations to get to that shorthand. Yeah. I think that's part of the process we all know and understand is you don't get to that like, hey, catchphrase relationship until you've gone through those long, yeah. up way too late at night conversations. Right. Because what would most likely happen, I'm guessing, is someone says something akin to courtship and the other starts feeling like, oh, like I'm failing. And, and and when you're in that, then you're now you're back to fight and flight because there's nothing that triggers one safety more than feeling like, oh, I'm falling short. And, and, and that I'm falling short in my most intimate relationship. Exactly. And I'm yeah. letting this person down and now I'm not safe. And something I hear a lot, you probably hear this too, is that kind of loop of I'm not enough or I don't know um, I don't know what they need from me or I don't know if I can be that. Those kind of enoughness type loops mm. um, become, I think, one of those biggest triggers of safety as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where the whole question of story is so important because if what one partner is asking for is for their other partner to play a part in their story instead of actually showing up as who they are, 
then I think that's a recipe for a really challenging relationship where, again, each person is really just performing for the other. Um, so Instead yeah. of showing up as themselves and, and being in the moment, being in the relationship. Exactly. And yeah. being open to creating a story together. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love that. You know, so much of your work has evolved and, and you've kind of taken us on this journey with you. And we've, we've talked a little bit about your work, um, through learning about your own dog to becoming a dog trainer to coaching couples, right? Like you've, you've gone along this journey and you've, you're now at this place where you have an amazing podcast. You've had on some of some guests that are like the biggest names in our field. You have some online courses. You've, you've totally transformed and changed your story through the years. Right. And I'm curious if you can share with us a little bit just about that whole journey about, did you envision all of this from the get go? Is this something that has just kind of, you've trusted in the process and it's, you know, like there's a relationship here with your own journey. Um, and I'm just, I want to learn more about that. Yeah. Great question. I did not fully envision where I am now and nor do I know where I will end up, although I have some great ideas about where that's headed. Um, it started out for me, the podcast anyway, in this part of the journey as um, really from a meditation around noticing for myself just how important relationship was. And I started thinking about, well, what would happen if my whole life were Revolve, revolved around relationship. And, and it wasn't something where I felt like, oh, there's something wrong here. Like I should actually be more focused on just me and like questions about my own relationships and all of that. Like that should be second. But what if I put it first? What would, that, what would that look like? And through a series of synchronicities, uh, that led me to the idea of starting a podcast um, to writing my first letters of inquiry to people who said yes. And that was that whole process was very mysterious for me, but I do have a certain trust in the mystical as well, that that when you tune in on that level to what really motivates you and what wants to be spoken through you, that doors open in a, in a way that's a lot different than having some idea. It's kind of like, are you trying to live into the story about yourself and who you think you're supposed to be versus what wants to emerge through you? Um, that's, that's where I've been, what I've really been trying to cultivate for myself and um, in my world. So you know, um, I just have yeah, to let ahead. you know that as you say, you, you lean into the mystical, that you are speaking to a couple of grinning women. And that is so much of our work is that leaning into your own intuition to that, like, I had a meditation on this and it came through, or just that I know that I have to in this internal knowing and that ability to get to, again, that word trust, to trust yourself that says, I'm being guided by a sort a deep and very important source within myself. And I feel a little bit like I'm being tugged by something external to myself. And when I can align these two visions, the magic is going to start to happen. Yes. Yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a pretty uh, concise way of summing up what this journey has been like, because things have just fallen into place. And I wouldn't have predicted, I didn't even have a goal for myself of like, oh, you're going to talk to all of these people and synthesize their work into your own course. Like none of that. For me, it was my curiosity and and whose work was calling to me and where it, it all seemed to fit together. And, um, and then just my own discovery of my love of having these conversations with people, which the two of you clearly have a love for as well. I can tell in how you are engaging the conversation. Um, so that has been another place where the magic has opened up and, um, and because there's so, there's so many different roads to Rome as particularly when it comes to doing couples work and, you know, everyone likes to think that their way is the way, um, and, you know, it's being backed up by research or, you know, they have, you know, 1000 testimonials or whatever it is. 
what I love to do, and so I see this as part of my work is um, really broadening the palette that people are aware of in terms of what could potentially, what they could call upon to create the the art of their own relationship or for therapists particularly um, who listen to my show. So they're aware of like, oh, there are these other ways of doing this um, and and maybe feeling free to experiment a little bit or take a take a risk if you know what they learned isn't quite working um, to not to be, be afraid. Curious. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so I that's been that. a big a big joy for me is to to really watch that unfold um, and to hear back from um, both just people in relationship who have been touched by the work that I'm doing, and then also the therapists who are like. Yeah, you know, there's only so much time really to get training and to to do to help broaden what you're trying to do. So um any way that I can like offer just like a enough of a taste so that people are like, "Oh, that person's work, I definitely want to learn more about that." Or that thing that I heard in your podcast, I'm trying that tomorrow with this client who has been totally stuck because I've been trying XYZ with them and it's just not working. Um, you know, I just thing. want to reflect back at you. I so appreciate that idea of there are many roads to Rome because mm. as I'm hearing you say, as you're talking about your own journey, there's this sense of organic unfolding and yet this beautiful alignment that's coming through at the same time. And we've had other guests on the podcast kind of talk about their own path and how they managed to be successful. And I will admit sometimes I'm like, I grit my teeth a little bit. I'm like, I don't think that I, 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 uh, in this case, your story rings so true. And that, that just organic alignment is that phrase I'm going to take from this. I, I came out of my own head as you're speaking, but I just appreciate that. And I feel like that's a, a beautiful way to describe a path that could work for people. Mm. That there are so many different paths and that some of the other paths you've heard about haven't resonated for you. This path resonates. And that makes it okay that the other ones didn't yeah. because it's like, oh, Neil's and the way that unfolded, that's the way I would tell the story too. I can see myself in that success. And sometimes you hear other people's success stories. You're like, I don't think that would work for me ever. I could never, ever do it. Oh, it's actually about the way the story was told and the way the connection was made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what I'm also hearing in that is the way that people, their story about success. And, and you know, I'm like a, a uh, perpetual reframer. So it's part of, you know, being an optimist. And, and yeah, there's so much in there about how people even reflect upon their own lives and their successes versus their failures. And um, as much as they're able to, to tune in to the guidance that was actually there available for them, even in those horrible mistakes that they made. Right. Um, that's like, there's so much value for them there. Oh, I feel like we could go off on a tangent right there for like another whole hour <laughs> <laughs> talking about tuning into the guidance of mistakes. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like that that's a whole nother thing, especially in relationships where so much of so much of what evolves from a relationship happens in the process of repair, happens in the process of noticing what didn't go right yeah. and how you come back. Yeah. Yeah, there's a great dog training metaphor with, um, you know, if you if you think about the way that people train dogs a lot of the time, like imagine your typical kind of like harsh trainer where it's like they, um, you know, the dog does something, it's like going along perfectly well and then they do something wrong and then they give them like a little jerk on the collar or say no or bad dog or whatever. That's like teaching someone to drive by like putting them on the highway and being like, and just trusting the guardrails to keep them on the road. <laughs> and so like as much as possible, like instead of putting cookies in the places you want them to go. <laughs> right. So, so as much as you can do both, like the cookies and the, and the guardrails, but even prior to those things, it's really looking at like what puts someone in a state of flow. So even if they veer off and hit the guardrail it's not like they're just trying to like live into a story of the right way to be like, oh, I messed up. So I'm going to have to 
like bam, like I, I really messed up and I did something wrong. And, you know, that's like where people go down the shame route, right? Mm-hmm. If instead someone is like in their flow, in that organic alignment, let's say, then they like hit it. And then it's just kind of like a course correct. It's like, oh, like feedback from the world saying like, oh, that was not quite right. Um and it steers you back toward where the cookies are, you know, in that in the middle of the path until boom, you hit the other side. But at least you're in your flow, not not trying to like do the right thing all the time or or Which is so the right hard. Outcome. That's yeah. such a hard story to live into. Yeah. 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 Really challenging. Yeah. The flow is so much easier. It's so much so much more fun. Mm. Yeah. That's my yeah. experience. Yeah. yeah. Except for those times when you're like, oh, I'm not in the flow. Like, shit, what did I, <laughs> like, I know I'm really messing up. Like, <laughs> well, there's, that, a- there's that, there's that story coming back in, the <laughs> exactly. one that you're trying to break free of. <laughs> Am I on the other side of flow? Did I not reach flow yet? Like, where is the, f- oh dear. Yeah. Okay. I need to sit down and take a time out. <laughs> right. Right. I need to reread that book by the dude whose name I can't pronounce, you know, yeah. about flow and like, that'll get me back to flow. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Neil, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to to dive deeply into all of this with you today. Thank you for, for holding this conversation with us. It's been really great to be here with you. Thanks so much for inviting me on. Thank you. Now, where can our listeners learn more about you and um, all of the wonderful things that you're bringing into the world? I know you have a podcast, you have courses, you have um, some giveaways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So if you're obviously you're listening to this podcast, so you know something about podcasts. My podcast is called Relationship Alive. We're on iTunes. Um, you can also check out my website, neilsatin.com. Um, my podcast is available there. Um, and if you're interested, I also have a quick guide that I put together with three really simple adjustments that you can make to your communication, particularly in relationship. So as opposed to like your general, like this is how you communicate better kinds of tips. These are tips that are designed to actually help you stay connected, even if you're in a a moment of conflict in relationship. Um, So, and I have a free guide for that. You can get it if you go to neilsatin.com slash relate. Or um, I have one of those fun text things. So if you text the word relate to the number 33444 and just follow the instructions, then it'll send you a link to the guide as well. Awesome. Um, and we'll also include yeah. it in our show notes. Thanks so much. Yeah. And if you're interested in the in the course, the Thriving Intimacy course that we mentioned earlier, um, Chloe, my partner, and I also have a website, thenewloveparadigm.com, and you can read all about our course there. Awesome. We'll include all of that for our listeners. Neil, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have you on today. You're so welcome. You know, one of the things I loved about our conversation today with Neil was how he talked so much about his own process and following the the magic and the mystery and that just kind of embracing that mystical trust. And knowing that underneath was a lot of hard work, right? Yes. But that it was interspersed with, as you said, mystical trust. Mm-hmm. And that in and of itself is sort of a muscle that you have to build, that you could give yourself permission to build. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think a lot of this also comes back down to the flow that he was talking about, kind of getting into that state of flow and just kind of tuning into your own inner guidance. And what I love about that is that kind of embodies so much of what we're creating on the revision retreat this summer. Yeah, because think about what a retreat is. It's a moment to take a step back from your everyday life and it's a moment to find your flow, to find a new flow because a lot of our focus is going to be on what do you want to envision for your future? What do you want to craft and shape? What do you want to bring into the world? And what have you been working on for a long time but just haven't quite been able to figure out how to manifest? So we want to create a space, a really gentle space to help hold you in all of that visioning. And we're going to include some radical things like (laughs) (laughs) self-care. Because softness is incredibly important and there's some things you should do full scale. And sometimes that's going to be taking care of yourself and pausing and listening to those still voices that are often hard to hear but that they're there when you can 
lean in and trust yourself and trust that little pull, that little tug that's guiding you in just that direction. And because you'd be coming on a retreat led by a relationship therapist and led by a storytelling coach, it's going to mean that writing is an important part of the discovery process. It may not be what you're seeking as an outcome, but it's going to be part of the way that you see yourself writing into relationships. It's going to be part of the reflection. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we hope that you'll join us. Please check out practiceofbeingseen.com slash events for more information. And if you love this podcast, please help us spread the word by subscribing, rating, and reviewing the podcast. Music written and performed by Christopher Ferris and produced at Kidneystone Studio.